Okay, so the skirt and horizontal infrastructure rebuild closeout report. Um, <coughs> thank you, gents, for coming. Um, David, would you like to introduce, obviously, I can see Rod there beside you. Would you like to introduce the report and uh, your presentation? So thanks very much. Um, this is a uh, skirt closeout report, and with me I've got... Um, Rod Cameron, uh, I think most of you know who Rod is, but Rod was the uh, value manager for uh, Skirt. Um, he was actually the, um, not sure whether the chief executive was the right word, but um, in the initial, after the first earthquake, uh, Rod um, headed up the group that looked at the re initial uh, response uh, to the damage, and then um, it got converted into a bigger model after the second earthquake in February. Um, I think everyone knows Peter. Peter's actually been, again, with the project for um, most of its lifetime of it. and has um, basically been running the financials, which have been verified uh, on all sides. So, um, been involved in the, in the figures, uh, Donkey Deep. We do have a few people supporting us and behind um, John, who uh, everyone knows, but John was in part of the skirt program. Ross also, who is part of the skirt and ran the, um, the uh, defects liability period, uh, basically when we wound down skirt at the, for the last 12 months, and I think everyone knows Piers, who again was part of the skirt uh, group. Um, you did ask, and uh, I'll move on to the first slide, um, the purpose of this report is to uh, fulfil this uh, recommendation from the committee, uh, request staff provide a full and final report on, report on SKIRT, including reference to the Horizontal Infrastructure Governance Group Independent Chairs Report, Independent Assessor Report and OAG Report, and noting any other reports that have been published. Um, we've given you a selection of reports in here. The intention of today is not to repeat, you know, we've given you that information in other reports, but it's to pull together that uh, uh, picture. And that's why we've called it the Horizontal Infrastructure Repair Program, because Skirt did the bulk of that work, but the Horizontal Infrastructure Governance Group covered other things. And a good example would be um, uh, basically Sumner Road, which was delivered outside of Skirt. But it's also willing, uh, w worth noting that Skirt also did a lot of things that weren't covered by the cost share. And Peter will get into the eligibility, uh, non-eligible programs. But you know, a very good example is Skirt uh, fixed the Bridge of Remembrance, the arch because they were doing the bridge and it made sense for them, uh, even though that wasn't subsidised by NZTA. So there was, there was a lot of things that they did in that way. Okay, key points is that the uh, program's principally completed. Uh, last big project really is Sumner Road, as you can see up there. Both skirt and non-skirt programs included works that were not eligible for cost share funding, and we can uh, explain that. It's reasonably complex about what got uh, uh, in and what got out. Both skirt and non-skirt programs were delivered, uh, delivered council-funded betterment or BAU projects where efficiencies in delivery were identified and funding was available. And it'll be worthwhile. I came on board to council in mid. 2014, and by that time, our betterment fund had basically run out. And so um, the opportunities as the program went on became less and less because of the additional funding. We'll talk about that funding as we go through. The remaining works to be completed are being delivered by council and are largely not part of the uh, shared funding agreement. So this principally uh, locks out um, what was done under the cost share agreement. Move on. Why won't it move on? There we go. Um, it's really important to look at what the Crown's obligation, and you've seen this up a number of times, and this is where I think quite a lot of misunderstanding. Certainly the words that were said by the Crown at the time of the earthquake and their obligations were totally different. But this is the Crown's obligation around horizontal infrastructure. It doesn't cover the transport side of it, but it does cover the three waters. So the aim of their assistance is to provide the minimum level of assistance required to restore the community the capacity for self-help. 
and to provide solutions that are most appropriate long-term solutions. And then at the bottom there it talks, wherever possible <coughs> government assistance will be provided in accordance with existing departmental policies. And basically this uh, was covered by the guidelines of civil defence and emergency management, which unfortunately changed. And again, Peter will explore that as we went through there. It doesn't actually guarantee that we will restore to previous levels. Um, so there are a number of fish hooks in that little description. Sorry? Can you just... Can, can, I, I wonder whether we go through the presentation and we come to questions no, after. Questions at the end. Would that be... Yes. Um, I think basically, again, this is a governance arrangements post-October 2013, which is which the majority was... Um, majority of the program was to live under. You can see Cabinet and the Minister and the Mayor sitting up there and uh, looking at this, principally equal partners. Um, sure. And then the horizontal <laughs> infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Apparently. apparently. I, I said apparently. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. all? Yes, it was. Yeah, before yes. I arrived too. Um, then we had the horizontal infrastructure group, which was chaired by uh, Chris uh, McKenzie, which uh, most of you knew. And then basically we had a number of technical groups that looked at standards and also looked at technical approaches, approved designs and a mixture of other um, combinations. Basically out the side for the delivery unit you had uh, skirt, which in actual fact sat outside that major governance arrangement but basically delivered, as I said, probably two thirds of the work that were involved. And there, sitting beside it, were a audit framework, and so there was an independent audit. There was an infrastructure program transition group that looked at how do we transition out of skirt back in here. And again, we've reported back to you. <coughs> and equally, sitting out of um, the the, um, the horizontal infrastructure management team, that sort of um, I don't know what colour it is, sort of a, a greeny bluey colour, aqua, shall we say? Uh, was a small management team that directed work either to skirt or, in actual fact, back into uh, some of the program that was delivered directly from council. You've had the uh, chair's report, um, and he covered the background to the governance. He covered key areas of focus of the HIG, covered the key program achievements, learnings and recommendations. His conclusion was the program was principally delivered on time and to budget and specification. And we again will talk about shortly the specification over time change because the funding of one of the major funding partners changed over time. Um, the combined work of the Crown and the Council had seen the horizontal infrastructure program costs significantly reduce from the initial cost estimates at the time of the cost sharing agreement. And we don't disagree with the statement, but the, um, possibly the reasons for that reduction, uh, we may disagree with the Crown. And again, through this presentation, we will uh, talk a little bit um, more about it. You'll find in there the Skirt Legacy Report. And again, um, on, on the um, right-hand side of our screen there, we have got the makeup of Skirt. If you have a look, uh, Skirt had a board. And the board had three funders, or what we call the owner participants, which was CERA, uh, New Zealand Transport Agency, and ourselves. And then it had the what we call the NOPs, the non-owner participants, and they were City Care, Downer, Fletcher's, Fulton de Hogan, and McDowell. Sitting underneath the board, there was a management team, uh, of which uh, Rod was part of that management team. And then sitting underneath there were various delivery teams. And the delivery teams were kept separate uh, around their various um, uh, main companies. However, there were, within the contract agreement, sharing of pain and gain, sharing of experience, um, a combined um, service delivery um, support team that actually supported right across. Same people that did the top for all of them, same people that did the technical work for all of them. Also sitting, and I'm not sure, CCC staff and consultants, you can see sitting out to the side, did principally the assessment and design work. And then we've got the independent verifiers and auditors. Uh, and that basically was covered by the skirt work. If you have a look down, um, 
they were tasked by certain functions, restoring functions to the roads. And at the first part of the uh, contract, basically it was done under indemnity. So basically we uh, had a free hand to get the city back up and running. And you know, from a public health point of view, from uh, that quick recovery, it certainly delivered quite substantial amount of work in a very short period of time with the very, I think, uh, minimum impact on the environment and minimum impact uh, on public health, which I think after the size of the uh, earthquake sequences we had is a credit because sometimes I'd do a job and they'd have to go back and do it because we had a further damaging earthquake in uh, June and another one in December. Um, strong emphasis is placed on creating value for money, which was backed up by findings and independent assessments, and we did have independent people pricing this. Innovation and introduction of new technologies have uh, created a lasting legacy, and you'll find a lot of those um, uh, <coughs> uh, new materials that we introduce are become our normal way of delivering services. Overall quality of skirt compares well with industry standards and again that will get covered in, uh, was covered uh, in the value report. And comprehensive information has been gathered about the current state of cities infrastructure and that data has been transferred to us. So in some places, um, and look I can't remember the figure, but something like 66% of our um, infrastructure has been CCTV'd, has been uh, rated and things and that while uh, Skirt didn't fix all that, basically that information has given us a good platform as we move forward. Um, we have reported back to you, and we did it as part of the LTP, the legacy. However, it will take many years and significant ongoing funding to address the remaining issues across the network. And again, as part of the LTP, you will remember we gave you the three sets of circles, one straight after the earthquake, um, we may have even given you one before the earthquake, one straight after the earthquake, one after the skirt program, and then we gave you a variety of different scenarios depending on how you'd fund that. So we've given you that kind of legacy issues information. I'm now going to hand over to Rod, who's going to talk you through the detail of skirt. Thank you. Um, we emphasised from the early stages that SCIRT is a programme of work, it's not a project. And th what developed was that SCIRT delivered 600 odd separate projects. So we started on that pipeline that's up, uh, described up there by assessing the assets. How bad is stuff and uh, what can be done in in a certain area of the city. So we assessed the assets, defined a project, and then we had a process which was relatively scientific of prioritising what work gets done first. Then it went through a stage of concept design for that particular package of work. It might be three blocks of the city or four blocks, something like that. Detailed design, which included preliminary cost estimation, but then properly costed by in-house cost estimators, which set a budget for that project. It was then constructed and handed over. And the earlier diagram showed that the five contractors were separate, and actually they competed for work. And their success, both financial, of delivering against the budget, and other quality measures that we put on them, dictated how much work they got. So it was a very competitive and therefore quite a lean organisation. Low overheads and a real focus on doing things for the best price. And uh, as over time um, their efficiencies were became apparent, then some of the five got more work than others. Uh, there was also, though, um, pain being inflicted on all by underperformance. So they had to share the pain and the gain. So if one of the five delivered um, five or six projects in a row that cost um, by running over budget, then half of that overrun was taken off the fees of everybody. So they had a very powerful incentive, not only to work well themselves, but to help each other work well. Not to share financial information, but to, uh, for instance, provide good quality supervisors, and they shared them, um, to make sure things were, the game was picked up. 
And that became obvious over a period of the years of SCIRP. The thing that wasn't so obvious was how the cost, uh, the total cost, was going to work out. We began uh, in the early days of observing the damage and saying, right, we're going to fix the damage. But as we became, it became clear to us in the first budget uh, that the total spend was going to be significantly more than the preliminary Turned off turned the mic. Off the, uh, oh. all, yeah, they all go off on the same button. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Whack him on the fingers, would you? Right. And so um, there were three, as the value of skirt report describes to you, there were three significant periods when um, the the total spend was revisited by those that complex group of people called the Horizontal Infrastructure Governance Group. And uh, Skirt really was the servant of that group to say, well, you tell us what to build and we'll build it. And um, the fundamental nature of Skirt uh, allowed that to happen without any penalties, without any delays, work carried on whilst the total sum was uh, done. Um, and that primarily, uh, those two factors, the competition and the ability to amend the scope, uh, delivered hugely on the value. I think that's all I need to say on that point, really. Uh, we had formal means of assessing how we were delivering on value as well. And we put measures on ourselves around those areas um, of getting started, doing the right work, doing it in the right order, and getting better at what we did. And those measures um, there were about 15 of them in all, uh, were reported monthly, and uh, we learned from them. And where we were underperforming, we tried to lift the performance. I think that's all I need to say in that area. One of the things that is uh, obvious to people outside of New Zealand is a major disaster rebuild can involve significant problems amount around the control of money. That didn't happen at Skirt because we had a very rigorous system of audits and checks and double checks. There was something like 24 independent audits done during each year. And that diagram, which is a little hard to read, but it's in the, in the um, report, shows that in every sequence of the progressive buildup of cost, costs were under control. There was almost no prospect that someone would deceive or thieve from skirt. And I'm very confident that that worked uh, incredibly well. So you can be confident that money, that taxpayer money and ratepayer money went where it was supposed to go. A lot of skirt was open book, but not between the delivery teams and the subcontractors. But the delivery teams, of course, were trying to beat a budget on every project. So there's no way they were going to let money run through their fingers. Thank you. Um, there's, there has always been a lot of discussion and focus, and I think it's a parochial thing, about, yeah, but where's the money being spent? So we, in the very early stages, developed um, a geospatial capability that allowed us to identify the areas of the city and where money was being spent. I think if you were meticulous and added up all those figures, you wouldn't get to the total that was spent because that map um, became so well recognised that we didn't have to renew it. It wasn't done in the last uh, year or so of skirt. It was probably 18 months or two years before the finish. Uh, it shows very strongly where uh, that the money was spent in the east. Um, which is where the major problems were. And a lot of that was done in the earliest days. I think that's all I need to say about that. And the next one is perhaps academic to you, but it's a fairly thorough breakdown uh, made possible by the financial systems of SCIRT, which showed you what got spent, what it got spent on. Okay, that's all I have to say about that, I think.
you'll be aware can that there can I begin on this? Um, so the Auditor General reporting um, was a very important element in the evolution of SCIRT. We welcomed them on site. We had nothing to hide. And their first report was very complementary of aspects of SCIRT, and their second one even more so, uh, because they had complete visibility. But, David, you yeah. the, speak the, to it. <coughs> you got presented with both these reports at an earlier date. The first one was uh, that set up the, uh, the new governance structure. And so that set up the Horizontal Infrastructure Governance Group. And then basically they came back, uh, that was in 2013, and then they came back in 2016 to actually see whether we'd made um, any progress on that. And if you have a look at the uh, couple of comments that they made, uh, in the 2013 report, the public entities told they were getting good value from SCIRT. In the 2013 report, we found that when relevant variables were considered skirt projects seem reasonably priced. And then basically they acknowledge the public entities have an audit framework that provides adequate assurance. It gave you the assurance that yes, we put in place their recommendations and they were delivered. And so they never came back for a third, um, a third audit, but it is an absolute independence of uh, everyone and anyone in that whole process. But as I say, you've had that before. Right, finances. Uh, so this might take a little while, so I'll, I'll try and uh, make it as clear as I can. Um, this first table is actually a replacement to the one in the cover report, which um, had an error in the second column. Um, so this is actually the comparison um, and replaces the one that's in paragraph 519 of the covering report. Um, that said, though, it was sort of the layout of the original cost share agreement. Um, that showed the uh, um, second to last line, the Crown's um, initial maximum share of 1.8 and their final share of 1.6 of a slightly higher number. Um, the uh, unusual item that's in the last column is in the middle, the 398 million savings to be found. Um, they couldn't readily be allocated to the other rows, so um, I've just put that there as um, a, a separate line item um, and they, they've been removed from the subsequent tables so we have a more apples to apples um, comparison of the gross costs. Um, as you can see that uh, the numbers include some of the above ground infrastructure that was in our insurance program so those were excluded from the cost sharing agreement. Um, as were parks, uh, I believe the mass movement was under another schedule, so it was not part of this, the horizontal infrastructure. And Pages Road Bridge was added to the non-skirt rebuild program later on, and so that's the increase from the what was projected at 48, um, is, explains most of the increase to that 73.6 million. Okay, next slide. So if we look at the total rebuild program, um, this table also includes the uh, interim assessment um, by Eleanor Trout in 2015 when she issued that report. So you can see the movement between the initial estimate on the right for the cost share to the final costs that have been recorded against the rebuild, both the skirt and the non-skirt. So the first row is really what was um, evaluated for the independent assessment, and it's what the, our co-funders, um, NZTA and Sarah, were really focused on. They weren't overly interested in the rest of the program. And so um, what we have is the second row is the ineligible portion of that co-managed program, and then we have a repeat of the other lines. The second half of this page, is, I guess the bottom third, shows you who delivered how much of each of those estimates. Um, but you'll see that the total has uh, always been above the three billion mark in terms of council's asset rebuild of infrastructure assets. So maintaining the focus on the eligible portion, so um, what you'll see there is uh, that this table refers only to that top row of the previous table. 
So the um, final cost, the 2.581 billion, um, was made up of uh, the infrastructure direct costs of delivery, so that's the actual project costs. The indirect costs refer mostly to the design, oh, sorry, not the design, asset assessment work, the overheads at skirt, uh, and some of the other uh, indirect costs of the delivery teams. So those all get allocated to the projects as they were handed back to us. Other costs were the cost of running, largely running the independent uh, pro, um, governance structure, the audit framework. Uh, that audit framework included the cost of those independent independent costings that Rod referred to. So as unit prices were set for each year, um, we had independent order of audit of what those prices should be. And then as those claims came through, we had another independent auditor looking at the actual claims um, against those uh, authorised prices. Um, and then the final, the 528 million was the early emergency and response costs um, that were largely incurred by the council program and so again a breakdown of who delivered what out of the eligible program um, so once we had started allocating the costs and, and a lot of the conversation was around eligibility. <coughs> so under the civil defence guidelines for the, the pipes, <coughs> pipe networks and NZTA funding rules for the roading, um, we then had this interesting little thing come along where the Crown uh, advised us that they would not fund effectively the depreciated portion of the assets we were repairing or rebuilding. Um, that uh, we uh, fought long and hard about, but ultimately lost that battle. So at the time the Cabinet paper was released to us, um, it was estimated that would be $75 million, effective transfer of cost to the Council. Um, you'll see on the following slide that actually uh, came down to $67 million, but still a sizeable chunk. So this table is just the final summary of the initial funding split of the eligible program, the transfer of those uh, depreciated portions to Council's funding, and uh, as Rod was elaborating earlier, there's the pain gain mechanism. The total alliance ended up with uh, approximately 12 million in pain, so they, they overshot their accumulated project <coughs> budgets by 12 million on a $2.2 billion program. That's a fairly laudable result. And uh, so what that means is we get half of that back from those delivery teams. So while they share that pain amongst themselves, they share 50%, the funders share 50%, and that was so like for like split of that uh, between the funders share. And uh, that is largely the financial picture as simplified as it could be for what is a, an extremely complex matrix of eligibilities, inclusions, um, what was insured, what wasn't insured, what assets went to NZTA, what assets went to the Crown and which ones were councils. We've changed this slide and we will get update this and put it back on the hub and I'll read it out to you because we had a bit of a debate about Oh no, it is the new slide. Oh, well done. Someone's put the new slide up there. Um, basically, why the horizontal infrastructure section of the cost share agreement, with its clarifications, refer to key guiding documents, we believe there was a large gap in understanding between the partners and the public around exactly what was going to be delivered. And we would be recommending some of the lessons learned, which we've picked up some of them out of the HIG uh, chairman's report. Uh, in future events, this should be resolved at the outset by clearly defining and documenting the relative roles, responsibilities and accountabilities of each party, including the expected collective purpose and outcomes. Ensuring that throughout the process there is consistent representation of all funding parties and those representatives have the necessary delegations. That one is actually picked straight out of the OAG report, basically. Um, ensure 
the appropriate reporting lines into the various agencies as quickly as possible, so establishing those um, reporting lines. Ensuring public announcements align with formal agreements, and uh, I already mentioned that the words that were said at the uh, initial outset and what was actually agreed to didn't align, and so that was part of the huge misunderstanding both uh, between the parties, parties and also between central, local government <coughs> and the public. And then uh, pre-prepare as much as possible so that all parties are aware of the likely commitment and obligations of the various other parties, rather than generating the documents after the event. And it would be fair to say um, it's probably something that hasn't been picked up that well to date. Every local authority, uh, central government, um, we need them to confirm what they're doing around renewals. Uh, has a huge, huge impact on local government. Uh, if they decide to fund renewals, it effectively takes um, their subsidy from 60% down to 30%. And that means the government, uh, central uh, local governments goes from 40% to 70%. And to find 70% is a heck of a lot different to actually saying after a big event, 40%. So there's a number of issues that we, sh I think, need to be clarified, we believe need to be clarified prior to another major earthquake. Um, in conclusion, we believe the Horizontal Infrastructure Programme has been very successful in in protecting public health and the environment while enabling the community of Christchurch to commence in its recovery. The Skirt Alliance proved to be an excellent vehicle to deliver a significant amount of infrastructure replacement and repairs, and it did more than that. It did the initial assessment, too, of trying to pull the priorities, and so you know, it's more than just what we've put in there. As with any program delivered under extreme pressure, the Horizontal Infrastructure Program became an incubator of innovation and successful test bed for new technology. And I went, um, after I was here about 12 months, I went to a water uh, conference and I saw this amazing technology and I thought, oh, that's good, we could use that in Christchurch. And they said, you've already got 700 of those in Christchurch already. And they were displaying stuff and photos from stuff that we had already in the rebuild and I didn't actually know about it at that stage. Um, there's no hesitation in recommending a similar alliance to any large community facing a significant infrastructure replacement renewal program, whether due to natural disaster or any other cause taking on board the lessons learned. And I think there's a couple of things. We've still got a large program. We brought back to you a report on how we would actually modify it, and that's where we got the HDM delivery model that we are delivering the um, three waters infrastructure under at the moment. Uh, it got picked up to deliver the Waterview Tunnel program. Their alliance was modelled straight off the um, Skirt Alliance. They did modify it because they brought into that alliance consultants as well as the main contractors. Uh, Rod's just told me it's been picked up as a housing delivery um, mechanism for Auckland, a, a similar skirt alliance, and of course it was picked up for Kaikoura and used as a basis for that. So the kind of skirt model, um, <coughs> including as part of the governance uh, arrangements, have been successfully applied elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure Rob may be able to help around whether it's been picked up internationally as, a, uh, as well as nationally, but... Um, that, uh, Mr Chairman, really gives you a quick summary of the documents we've put in front of you. Um, I think it's really clear and um, we're happy to leave. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I'm happy for you to leave too. No, I think there'll be a few questions. Um, look, I mean, it, it is a great um, a series of reports there and pretty much covers um, everything. I mean, ob I mean, obviously some of the big issues um, were around the budgets and the change in budgets halfway through the program. So it'd be quite good just to tease out the impact, I mean obviously we know the impact, it costs money, the program came to a halt, but the impact of that on the alliance model as opposed to a different contracting model, we can't change the budget side, that's up to the, the funders. But in terms of how the skirt model responded to that, it would be quite useful to understand that. Certainly, um, and, and Rod will probably give you some more details, one of the advantages of alliance contract, and, and we remember, we are a party to that alliance. We sat on the board. It did enable um, any changes, whether it changed in scope, because we did change standards halfway through. It changed for funding requirements. It changed for different emphasis and different parts. The alliance does give you that total flexibility. Of, 
not don't know about total, but a lot more flexibility than a standard contract. If we were under a standard deliver, uh, design deliver contract, basically any of those major changes, I think, would have ground the machine to a halt. We would have been paying then overhead costs where the Alliance was able to morph into continuing with other things that it had, right size itself for the needs and um, whatever, and track progress and projects through the various gateways that Rod showed. Rod, I don't know if you want to add anything to that? Very little to add. Um, there were three major interruptions, but they didn't stop us at all. Um, sure, the designers were uh, had to do a lot of extra work, and that reflects this um, within the cost structures. There's clearly identified the cost of that redesign, but um, the work was able to continue, so the public didn't know there was uh, interruption. And uh, partly because we had small contracts, uh, small packages of work everywhere, um, there was a significant amount of flexibility. So that was a great feature. In terms of the, the pay and gain structure, how, how did that work and how, how did the various contractors cope? Performed. With um, so they started out with 20% of the work each. So as projects were delivered, it went around the, the five, one to them, one to them, one to them. And as they under or overperformed, yes, um, some contractors got two projects while another only got one. Um, the final split ended up with uh, one getting nearly 24% of the work and one getting down about 17% of the work and the other three were scattered in between. Um, a lot of that uh, disparity occurred within the first couple of years because a lot of subcontractors came into town and underperformed uh, financially um, and um, by and large they were got rid of or left. Uh, this is a very difficult environment in which to work in the ground and we knew that before we started. Uh, I think also uh, the change in scope had a disruptive effect on those contractors in a secondary way which is they couldn't align all their subcontractors to a rigorous work program in the way that we might have if we didn't have the disruption. But that's very much secondary. And it didn't reflect in cost, only in deployment flexibility. Mm. So Dave, in terms of the fact that we, we are running you know, various panels for our contractors at the moment, do we use a pain gain process or do you just weed them out through other means? <laughs> We have got pain gain in some of our contracts. We're not running them within the panel. We are running, however, a similar allocation model. If you're successful, you will get it. And we report, I think, quarterly, do we, on our panel allocation? And you will see uh, across the panels it's certainly not evenly split. Probably, in John's here, we've probably got six or seven on each one of our panels. And I would say there's probably three that would get 75% or 80% of the work, um, and then the others get dribs and drabs. Um, uh, if they perform, they will get the next job, particularly if they can perform to price and to time. Uh, it's certainly the way we've been able to deliver the Wellhead program, uh, really, really successfully um, doing that. John, I don't know if you want to add anything else? No, um, we have very regular meetings with all the panellists to talk about performance and any concerns that we have um, and so provide <coughs> consistency on things like health and safety um, and the approach to their work. But that's, uh, uh, it, it provides a good forum for feedback both ways. Hmm. Um, Rod, in turn, so if there's anything that you could go back and do differently, what would that be? I think, um, personally, it would have been to force the conversations with the three funders at an earlier stage about working together. Because initially, whilst Skirt was creating its first budget, the funders, as the Auditor General's report described, um, weren't really active in the space of, well, how are we going to split these costs? Who's going to be responsible for what? What impact does that have? All clients are intent entitled to say, well, we don't want to spend as much or we want to spend more. Uh, that wasn't really the issue. The issue was the time that it took to work out the impact 
of that. And the shift in um, uh, the way in which work was judged, um, performance uh, of shall we do a level of service or shall we uh, just cut the money. So I would have said at the early stage we could have had more interaction of the three. And what I'm now involved with is trying to convince government we need to be better organised for disasters and a key part of that is high level governance arrangements, which David, without any prompting from me, also alluded to. We need to work it out because leaving it till after the event is not the way to do it. I think that's exactly one of the findings that came from the uh, Hig Chair's report as well. He said a couple of things I'm not quite sure I agree with. He thought we should go from um, uh, indemnity uh, funded to appropriation earlier. From our point of view, <laughs> indemnity funding was not bad. I would have liked to keep it going for longer, but you know, we're slightly on different sides of the fence here. Um, but then um, that appropriation should then be clearly defined, and, and, and Chris certainly brought that out as one of the recommendations, and that's what Rod is doing. One of the things I would like to add, I, when I first arrived and got involved with Skirt, I sat on the Skirt board for a short period of time, then I moved on to the HIG. I was impressed with the ability for Skirt to give young people a real opportunity to do some amazing things. You know, we had young engineers, both male and female, that were absolutely having opportunities that they could never get. And I thought Skirt did a huge kind of, we haven't really mentioned in here, it's, probably, it's in the value report, opportunity to develop people way beyond anything they could do. And you know, you'd have, and I, they looked about three actually, uh, that's how old I'm getting I suppose, but you know, you had people in their late 20s that were running a $50 million work site, and they were doing it incredibly well. Um, I, was, I was impressed with the kind of calibre of people and the way they could lift themselves in that. Mm. I mean, one thing we don't talk a lot about is, is Skirt as a high-performance organisation. Um, I mean, do you think, I mean, when you look at some of the contractors in the Alliance who are obviously working for us now, do you think there's been any fall-off in in standards around that kind of high performance, the noble purpose, that kind of sense of mission that comes after a natural disaster. And then as you go back to business as usual, are they still performing at that same level? Or have you noticed any changes to how the individual contractors are now working? Um, I'm not sure it's a necessary changes in the performance. What we've gone back to is business as usual and so that where we had a chain that could go along, you know, bang, 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 we'll move straight from this phase into the next. We now have a whole pile of kind of checks and balances that have gone back in to the system. So it slows the, the delivery down to a certain degree. Um, yes, there are, you know, one of the things that amazed me, um, I'd go out and I'd see a subcontractor who was running a site for, you know, one of the main contractors and their health and safety were absolutely outstanding. Then I'd go and see them doing a job for another client and their health and safety was actually terrible and it, it was embedded in what the principal or their head contractor had and I thought that would get involved into their culture and suddenly they get away from that little bit of control and they go back into their bad habit well I don't know if bad habits the right word but they go they, they do go backwards so some people I think are designed to be subcontractors and when they become a head contractor they don't actually realise the value right. that the head contractor runs and that's around environmental control, it's around health and safety, it's around uh, scheduling of plant and all the rest of it. Um, there's some contractors I say are good subcontractors but not necessarily good head contractors, I don't know. I feel similar. Okay, that's enough questions for me. Um, anyone else got any? Dion? Thank you. It's, it's quite a big report and there's a lot going on in there. I've got a couple of things I wanted to ask about. Um, one was the land drainage um, recovery program. I've, you know, reading the report, obviously some money was funded or eligible in the years one to three, um, but there was no eligibility or, or there was further conversations to be had around years four to ten. But I haven't seen much of that come through and there's $127.5 million that was eligible. Um, that I'd like to know where we've got to on that. 
if you have a look at the eligibility criteria, you needed to do a damaged asset and you need to fix that damaged asset. Now, because the ground sunk, the, damage, the asset might not have been damaged, so they said it wasn't eligible. We would argue that its level of service has been damaged because it's sitting up in the air and the water can't go uphill, um, but we didn't win that argument. Um, the rest of the land drainage recovery program really is now part of the cost share agreement um, negotiations. Um, that's where it's really sitting um, and so it's going to get wrapped up in that whole um, uh, package. Yeah. Well, I'd like to make sure so, that So, yeah, but... what you've seen, that $127 million was what we, we could find, cracked pipes, broken pipes, um, you know, manholes, that sort of stuff that were eligible. And there were, there were some things, but it, it, also some of the land drainage pump stations were covered by insurance, obviously, which made them in, ineligible as well. And, uh, yeah, okay, I'll write that down, I'll follow that one up. Um, around the budget, I'm just, I'm just a little bit confused. I, well, not confused, but the original agreement was 1.8 million or billion. That got reduced to 1.689 billion through that 2015 cabinet paper, and then the final amount that the crown paid was 1.601 billion. Yeah. So the the cabinet paper was based on an earlier estimate of the balance of the program. So that's obviously come down from that estimate. So that was um, when was that announcement? Oh, December 17, was it? But, the, but, but, but what I'm trying to understand 16. here is that we have also an increase in the council cost for $111 million. Um, so $111 million from that 2015 change, you know, the government directed the council to reduce the, or, yeah, to reduce the budget in line with their reduction, yet at the closeout we spend $111 million more, but the Crown have wash their hands of $88 million, which they've probably budgeted, but have absorbed back into their balance sheet, I imagine. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not I sure just, what they've done I, with it, but yeah, it I feel like all, it's a result of the process of the scope change that was done through there, the eligibility reviews as the program came through. Um, so there was a lot of work there and a lot of conversations to try and uh, maximise what we could get into the eligible program, um, but there was also other things that we have added to the program, so our insured program cost us more. Yeah, I'm only, yeah. I'm only talking and I'm only extrapolating the, from, from what I can tell, the eligible yep. numbers, and I just, it really concerns me how much <laughs> it hasn't, I mean this is the funding issue, obviously it's, um, you know, it's, it's not yep. been great, but, oh, it's, but it's, it, it's really, it's not good. I'm going to say it's not good. And the other question I have around that was, um, in terms of the success of the program, a common gripe that people have was that you know you'd have a, a road that would be dug up, then it would be laid back down, it'd be dug up, there'd be some more work, it'd be laid back down, it'd be dug up. The coordination of the work was probably one of the common gripes through the through the skirt program. And would you recommend having any other way of coordinating other services such as, you know, because we had an ABLE go from the west to the east and then we had the skirt program go from the east to the west kind of thing. Um, has there been any of that kind of work as well being brought into what we're looking at in this report? We, uh, you know, the coordination is, is, is a real problem and it really did hit a home at Pages Road where basically um, we went through one way, uh, Enable went through probably six months later than us and went through the other way and we had pretty much all of um, that area dug up at one stage and um, we did try and we do. Piers has given you a little bit of um, background on the Ford Works Viewer which is uh, start to try and uh, um, um, coordinate work between various agencies and whatever. Um, the real issue is that all the funding doesn't necessarily come together at the same time, so we're certainly working through that program. One of the advantages of SKIRT, however, is uh, if they were commissioned to repair the water mains, the sewer and the stormwater and the road, they would coordinate it all at once and they give out a package of work to be done just in that area. However, it didn't do that well sometimes when either Orion or Enable or any of the other providers happen to come through after um, do that. So when we're considering, like, uh, you know, the, there would be no hesitation in recommending a similar alliance, is this going to be broadened out into other infrastructure works and, and service works 
like power, all of those things. I mean, it, it needs to all be together. Is that what the recommendation is going to be? What we're saying is an alliance is a, a very good way to deliver a huge amount of infrastructure in a very coordinated and quick time, especially when you don't know what the damage is. I can't actually force ourselves. There's a utilities guidelines. There's national legislation that covers what utilities can do and can't do um, in our road. And I can only put conditions on them. I can't stop them and I can't actually coordinate them and say, you must do this at that. However, we can do things like I'm putting down a new road here, and by the way, if you go through there, and admittedly it'll get tested in court, if you go through there in the next three years, you replace the whole of the whole of the road. I may be able to put a condition, whether that's seen by the court to be fair and reasonable, don't know. So maybe um, there's some more work that may need to be correct. done around and we have the, the, those regulations those authorities as well. to try and coordinate as much as we can. Right, all right, yeah. And one last thing that I've got here is that, you know, that the report says you know three percent of our water infrastructure or freshwater infrastructure was replaced under the skirt and we're seeing so much problems starting to come you know right to the head with water infrastructure uh in the city and you can't say that none of that was earthquake damage related um why was only three percent of the water infrastructure replaced under the skirt Two things, water infrastructure is incredibly difficult to evaluate what the damage is until it actually breaks. You know, I can run a key TV camera through a, a wastewater pipe or a stormwater pipe. I can't run a TV camera through a, uh, water, a water pipe because it's full of water. Uh, and basically I don't want to put a TV camera through a potable water supply. And so it's not as easy to assess. There's a couple of other things. If you look at the uh, materials that we've got um, in our water supply system, a lot of it's reaching the end of its uh, natural life. Uh, it's AC pipe, it's uh, on average 60 or 70 years old. And so there's a, a, a wider range of issues involved. Um, it's not as easy to assess as the other, or the other three services. I can easily uh, assess the road. I can easily assess. But I mean, that, 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 that kind of feel, you know, that feels like a cop out to me. I mean, the, the damage is done from the earthquake. We had the government partnering with us to fix a lot of this infrastructure damage. We've got three percent of it fixed, but we're still facing infrastructure damage. Most likely, you know, if we could find ways to say that actually it's still a lag from the earthquake damage, and there's it has to be. Um, why are we not sort of saying to the Crown still, we've still got work to do? And, and we have. You've got to actually recognise, and that was the slide we put up, their obligation was to get us back on our feet. Their obligation is not to replace all the damage. And I think you've got to be really clear. We are back on our feet. Um, and that's what they would say, and that's why it's been closed. It's not we will repair all the earthquake damage. And so basically they're doing... I can't get, you know, it wouldn't have been economic for me to get skirt to dig up every pipe and look for every crack. Uh, um, you know, there are now non-destructive methods of, let me hear someone, ultrasonic scion down them. There are new techniques that have come in that will help us locate some of that damage. But you've got to also recognise what was the Crown's obligation under the cost share agreement, uh, under the uh, national I mean, legislation. I mean, you, can, you could argue that we're not yet on our feet around water infrastructure. We're having to spend huge amounts of money and, and prioritise a big amount of budget, which is holding back a whole lot of other stuff. I mean, uh, yeah, it I'm going to... achieve new standards. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, Dylan, we've had this conversation over the last three years. So this, yeah, I, I, I just... I've, uh, yeah, there's big problems. Uh, Phil. Thanks, Rev. I think that a lot of this is about people's expectations and the beliefs that people had early on. And, and I, I just want to, um, I'm pleased that you've cop copied in the skirt spend within the different wards. Um, and, and I guess like we, we've still got people who come to us and say you've done nothing in our area. But for example, and I'm not picking on any, any ward in particular, when you add up what's in Coastal and Burwood together, I mean, that's a huge amount of money, which is, here's the thing, it's under the ground. So people kind of like, there was all that spend, which actually um, people, they saw all the, all the, the, all the disruption and, and that interfered, but it's kind of like the, that part, that's, it's quite, they're hidden costs and hidden investments that people now just don't notice because they, they want the other stuff on top. Yep. Well, I concur with that completely. I understand that. And the one that rubs the salt into the wounds is the standard of the roads. And fundamentally, the road repair was term cut 
because that was regularly the last part of work that needed to be done. So when you got a major shift in the total funding, it was the roading, but also some water supply work that was not done mm. under the skirt program. So yes, we've got a roading legacy that's, well, not, not sure what the, the word to describe it. Not up to scratch, just for you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, one lesson here, and this is something we constantly have to deal with at council, is that a stitch in time saves nine. I mean, sometimes you spend a lot of time trying to cut small amounts of spending. They will cost you way more in the future. And if you've done it at the time, so all the money that the, the Crown cut out of the, the skirt program, if they'd just done it the first time, it would have been way cheaper. And now, you know, we're going to have to pick it up. It'll be more expensive. And that's, you know, that is a lesson in trying to sort of meet some, you know, budget surplus requirement or whatever. I agree. And uh, another element is the psychosocial aspect. And recovery is about people feeling better. And I certainly don't feel better when I drive down some of our roads. Um, I find them upsetting. Yep. No, good but point. But it's part of what we should learn from disasters. And I hope we can convince government that these are relevant elements to um, disaster work and recovery. Yeah, well let's hope there isn't a next time, but there probably will. Well, there uh, will be a next time. Yeah. Um, Dave. Uh, thanks. Yes. Um, yeah, thank you for a very comprehensive report. And I just really want to focus on 5.22 of your report where you um, talk about the cost share eligibility, uh, clearly spelling out roading works will be attended to under the NZTA program and funding manual, which I think don't think we had too many problems with, but carrying on, all other works needed to meet the definition uh, in the National Civil Defence Emergency Management Plan. Um, now, the Mayor and I actually had an exercise in trying to actually figure out what the National uh, Civil Defence Emergency Plan set out, and I'm, I'm really sort of wondering what degree of understanding uh, you guys had and if there was a clearer um, um, explanation of the um, things that were going to be covered, whether that would have helped us further. And, and thirdly, going forward, is there a need uh, in, in another disaster to have a very clear um, definition of what exactly is covered under the National uh, Civil Defence Emergency Management Plan, because I certainly could not make any sense out of it at all. And, and I think that is, particularly that's that bottom point there on the lessons learned, pre-prepared as much as possible, and really I think that's a lesson for uh, um, the government as much as for us. You know, local government needs certainty about what they will fund, and, and a lot more than what we did entering into day one after a major earthquake. Um, <coughs> So in actual fact, you can do it. And, and you know, the biggest jump in that is the funding of renewals or the non-funding of renewals, which could lift our obligation. You know, if, the, if this was funded at 30%, we would have had another um, 1.8, we would have had another $600 million on our account taken off their account. And so um, that's quite a significant amount uh, of, of shift. So, I agree, David. Um, you look at the words in the plan and the guidelines, and they are all open to interpretation. Yeah. Um, so, so are we any, going forward? You know, six years on or more, are we any clearer in our uh, definition of what we could expect to cover under the National Civil Defence Emergency Plan, or is it still quite open-ended to interpretation? I'm a little bit removed. I imagine local government New Zealand's doing a bit of work on trying to clarify that, but I don't have a feeling that we are that much further ahead. I don't know. Yeah, there was, there was a proposal from Treasury in the previous government to change the standards. That didn't go through, so it's still sitting in Treasury. So it's still open to a quite amount of interpretation. Yeah, so the current system still stands, yeah. Which is not exactly that great for any not for the next person no because no. the indemnity will run out very very quickly yeah so that there's an expectation that councils are properly insured whereas we weren't properly insured mm. yeah. um aaron yeah just two two semi quick questions um one is because uh, the question is asked for your time and don't know the answer fitzgerald ave where 
it meets the river and it dips down real low when there's a heavy rainfall um, it floods across the street um, and I, it's great traffic calming but as the and a reminder of um, climate change and stuff but why is that so low do we ever find out it's the same level as what it was originally but what happened is the original the had flood. a solid uh, barrier uh, yeah. instead of and now they replaced the solid barrier from between the river and the pedestrian with a rail and so the water just flows through the rail where the past the rail the solid barrier used to be part of the stop bank yeah. and so what you've got is the levels of the road are the same my understanding I think that's correct yeah. uh, but the the what used to be a solid barrier was replaced with a rail and so the water flows through it yes so um, yeah it's one of the um, and, and I know we got a lot of flack about when it was first put in I think it was one of the early jobs yeah. done um, the yeah. the so then the question would be is there going to be a wee barrier added to the edge of the walkway there that possibly will be waterproof we could at some stage uh, do that. It would come up as part of the capital program that would actually then replace that level of service. However, we've just got other priorities at this point in time uh, for the amount of time that there's water on there. Right. It's manageable. It's not... Um, yeah. Uh, but, yes, it probably will come up as part of your capital program at some stage. Um, so maybe the next LTP we could add the Fitzgerald Ford. Um, to, the, uh, to, the, to the list. And then the other one is, uh, and you may have done it, and it's just purely a numbers game, did anyone ever work out the cost and timing if we hadn't done skirt? Did anyone kind of go, well, if we hadn't done skirt, we would have done it this much quicker or this much longer in the old system, and it would have cost this much more or this much less? I'm assuming it's worked out quicker and cheaper, um, but did anyone ever do that? those two numbers. The problem is, uh, Aaron, you could walk through a wide range of different scenarios if we did it this way, that way. We believe what we've done is quite optimised. It would be fair to say that after the first earthquake we had one system in place, immediately they got the best brains that they could find to work out, gee, the amount of damage after the second earthquake escalated to, and I'll make something up here, ten times as yep. much what's the best way to approach this. They took the best experience from around the world and applied that. Um, and so I think at that kind of original business case, and I must admit I think it took a bit of courage from both council and from the Crown to go into an arrangement like that. Mm. But basically, um, Rod, I don't know whether you were part of that decision-making process at that time. And we certainly didn't try and do figures about one method versus another because the fundamental challenge was getting work done and uh, going to market competitively by having to create designs and so on would have been a very long protracted process and the other problem of in-ground infrastructure is you actually can't see how bad the damage is and so the skirt creation of its first proper estimate took 12 months uh, 12 months where we had up to 30 sucker trucks around these streets uh, exposing the pipes for us so it was all focused on delivery of outcome for community need. And uh, then the focus shifts from resource, well, how do we contain costs? Well, we made it a competitive, uh, a cost competitive process that ensured we got it done for the least amount of money in the circumstances. So I'm very comfortable that it was a great solution. I wasn't completely in favour of it in the early days, but I became convinced and uh, I think the results stand for themselves. Okay, thank you. Um, Glenn. Thank you. Just four quick uh, questions here. The first, you mentioned the low overheads. Uh, Rod, are you able to kind of give a percentage of the total skirt cost, although obviously OBEX, CAPEX are different? Yes, that's right. Um, it's in the value of skirt report, and just off the top of my head, uh, asset assessment took about 7% of the turnover. Uh, design took about 7%. Um, the non-site overheads were, I think, perhaps 8 or 9%. And Peter, you might re remember the figures better than me because he's a figures a numbers man. And um, Pardon? Not that deep. Not that deep. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. So that, that cost structure, by the way, about halfway through skirt, we were concerned about our cost structure. And I did personally did an exercise as the value manager and compared an alliance in Australia, uh, a large project in New Zealand, and a conventional delivery, as Aaron has just asked, and yeah. the skirt factors. And skirt got more pipe in the ground per $100 by about 2% than any other option. Right. And I'll buy about 10% against a conventional price it before you start work option. Yeah. Okay. So I'm very comfortable that it was lean. The design has cost has been criticised in some quarters. And people in the UK who are very interested in this said, wow, you spent as much as 7%. We wouldn't have. But we treated design completely in isolation, so the delivery teams didn't do any design, so there's no hidden design cost in there, and we had to do quite a lot of redesign because of the cost share agreement. Okay, yeah. I'll cut one question out, but just two more. Um, the, the Ford Works viewer were all parties who uh, uh, that related to prepared to sign up to that and prepared to exchange? I think the Ford Works View is a separate project that's been run. It was funded out of Linz, you'll remember, okay. and then oh. we've taken it over. So it's a separate yeah. process. But we've had really good buy-in from the private and public sector. Right. Uh, you'll get, you know, private uh, builds on, um, you know, private land uh, being built into Ford Works View because quite a lot of them spill out into the road reserve and all the rest of it. So we've got a pretty good buy-in to that. Okay, we didn't seek formal agreement in the early days. We just said we'll create something and use it if you wish. And the yeah. take-up was very good. I know Duncan wanted the one big principle and kind of yes. regretted it a bit later. But just the, well, the final... Yes, but, uh, you know, I Be think... Because that, it set the bar so high. Well, know. that's right. But uh, um, a comment was made earlier that we dug and redug. Uh, that's folklore and it's not fact. <laughs> And um, there's very little redigging done by skirt. It was done all over the place in the east by us. So our company Enable came along after skirt and sure. Redug well, we didn't have control over Enable. Right. And um, yep. I, to answer, give my dollars worth on that comment earlier. After a disaster, everyone possible should be in the right. alliance. Yeah. Okay. Um, but it's very hard to force people. Yeah. Fair enough. And my final question was over the. Eleanor Trout review, Dave, and whether uh, she concluded the Crown wasn't any more liable. According to our terms of reference, do you think maybe they were too narrow for that? I would have said that staff try to argue absolutely everything we could yeah. into the uh, into that equation uh, right through. Um, but at the end of it. Um, the Crown wanted to get out and they right. wanted to get out and they actually dug in there and they looked at all the ways they could get out of everything, okay. including suddenly coming up with the funding of renewals. And you know that really annoys me because they said you should have made provision for it. But right at the outset we said we are using our renewal money to actually pay for our share of that damage. Yeah. And they clearly knew that. And so we didn't have another pocket of you know, a, a renewal bucket sitting over here that we could Spend on that and, yeah, no, we won't go there. Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Jimmy. Thank you. Uh, uh, I keep it up for the Toronto Infrastructure Governance Group the report. That's fantastic. Uh, convince me, you know, particular 4.1 to 4.9. But 4.9 summary particular emphasize uh, this key program achievement in short the Toronto infrastructure program was delivered on time to budget and the specification uh, based uh, for recovery outcome. Yeah, I, I totally agree because I remember I have uh, during last uh, particular several years I've been in a skirt to listen to their the presentation for two or three times. I was very impressed is regarding to their governance and the management project uh, uh, the uh, the management information system. In that system, we we we, we consider yeah. each individual project there uh, uh, how much percentage has been done, mm. uh, but how much is ahead of the original schedule or behind the schedule? What's 
problem, you know, why is behind schedule or why is a ahead of schedule? Those the uh, uh, the project uh, the uh, management information system, whether we have learned, you know, from skirt to the council, I just want to know. And we've certainly transferred a lot of the systems um, we, we've demoed, or the report that you get on the capital program uh, under Paragon is really taking up the skirt project management reporting and then we've enhanced it and we've actually enhanced it uh, with the same developer as that system. For example, peers can talk about a whole pile of the data and the systems that we have transferred because um, we have pillaged as much as we possibly can. Is that the right word? Probably not. So, I mean, the, the approach that we took with that transition of all the information and capability that we had in SCIRT was actually broken up into a number of discrete areas. Other than just transferring, bulk transferring information in, for instance, our condition information around our pipe network, could have just brought that into council. And part of the, um, part of what I recognised when I first joined council was that I could do that relatively easily. I can lift and shift the information into council. Our ability to consume it, actually deliver value from that information going forward, was extremely hard. So, you know, this is where we talk about the asset management capabilities. Other than just transferring the information in, there was also a component of bringing the right people in. I uh, brought a lot of um, skirts team that are either directly within my team or that have been responsible for bringing in capability. And the platform that you refer to specifically is called Hiviz. And we've taken not only the developer and the learnings from that and the way that we report information about a capital delivery program, and we've taken that and we've built that within council. And we used the same individual that was working at Skirt to rebuild effectively Hiviz Mark II, so known as Paragon, and bring that into council to affect the change not only in the way that we look at the value of the information within there, but it helps us manage the program. And that's fundamentally shifted the way that the teams are utilizing platforms like CPMS that you talk about, about the GIS platforms that we brought in, you and the way that teams consume that data time, so that they can do their work more effectively. Yeah. Yeah. So it was lots of different yeah. aspects. The system, the information, the people, yeah. and a lot of the processes that were brought in from SCIRT yeah. are being progressively um, integrated into accounts. We always talked about protect it, that was the identification. Transfer it, that was the initial, you know, you saw the diagrams up on, on the board. And then adopt it. And we're very much in the adoption phase, and my team's about adopting a lot of those that capability. Thank you. Uh, sorry, question. Okay. If they should, uh, my uh, concern is, is it possible, you know, because uh, they did have a governance rule, have management rule, etc. The possible can based on this uh, uh, the information system whether can convert to the for the governance or like for the mayor and councillors. We check all the the computer system. We can see the high level. You know those, those projects. Uh, even we have no meeting, but we can check. Uh, you know, hey, we know this uh, particular major uh, particular is ahead of schedule or behind the schedule, what's the problem? It's not a detail, just high level is possible. And we are looking at that, the PMO is looking at ways that we can report on, or you can drill down on individual. Now some of it you can do already, um, but others you can't. And it's just a matter of how do we get that um, visibility without, in actual fact, risking some of those contractual relationships because yeah. CPMS, uh, Paragon's a window into CPMS and into SAP which contains a number of contractual commercial information, so we are trying to work on that uh, to give you uh, access and better visibility over that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yanni? Yeah. I mean, thanks. Thanks. That's been put together on this. <coughs> um, one of the lessons learnt that doesn't seem to have been captured, and I'd be quite interested as to what your thoughts are on it and why it hasn't been specifically identified, was for local communities to have input into the decision making around what's going on in their local communities. Mm. And there's fleeting reference within all the documents over things like the pressure sewer system and a court case, but there's no kind of lesson learned around the opportunity to engage around design 
at a local level, which I'm quite interested in as to why not. Two, two things I would say to you is this is a rapid recovery system and basically, obviously, we could, we could put that. I'm not actually sure that would be, a, if, particularly in the early stages of advantageous to the community as a whole, because basically you're risking environment, you're risking public health. So what they did make is a machine that was streamlined as fast. And one of the things that did go was the level of consultation. Don't get me wrong, they still had to get resource consents and things like that, but basically they didn't actually go and consult over you know, the mains going down this street and that street and the disturbance. Um, and look, we did annoy Skirt did annoy. You know, I remember getting calls, you know, because we were Kango hamming at three in the morning in some places uh, up the Port Hills um, and sort of some of that. But basically, it was to get things done, delivered. Um, so, no, it's possibly not a lesson learned. It could be something that you might want to add as council. I think there's got to be a, an element, however, of we were in unique conditions. Um, when I do say that, I must admit the over each individual project in progress, probably Skirt lifted the level which we have adopted on all of our projects. We now have notices, the notices that we put out to individuals. So we've adopted some of that really good practice that they delivered, not necessarily up front of the project, but as the project progressed, we hopefully have picked up a lot of those uh, lessons learned. And I think we're doing things a lot better than what we did Prior think, to you know, being on the I think it's important to separate out the communication to the input into decision making from local communities. And I think there are some very serious lessons that need to be learned around things that just got put back, like for like. Remember like for like? And you know, that sort of transformed into less for like. And it all started out as sort of stronger Christchurch. So, you know, if you take the Fitzgerald Bridge, for example. Some of us would have loved to have an engagement with the local community over what to do there, bearing in mind that you know decisions like the red zone had just been announced, uh, and yet there was no opportunity. So I, I personally think it is something that we should really think about. You've got community boards making local decisions who didn't have a lot to do during this phase. You had communities that you know wanted to be involved that were completely shut out around just having an ability to provide some very um, common sense long-standing uh, things like minor, minor safety improvements with how we were putting things back that weren't able to be incorporated. You know, and I'll give you the example of Linwood Avon, Woodham Road, Avonside Drive, where that all comes together. You know, one of the, one of a dangerous intersection, put back as it was, like for like, uh, and yet people would want it a roundabout there or safety improvements for years. And then, you know, six months after it's done, there's a huge crash. It, it just doesn't seem like that lesson really has been learnt. So, I mean, I would just hope that we could we could look at that. I um, I was interested in, again, another lesson that hasn't been picked up in here, but it, it's maybe hidden, saying things like public announcements align with formal agreements, um, and, and there's a number of sort of things about documentation. But the advice to governance at council law level seems to have had quite significant gaps and I don't know why that hasn't been identified in here. So I've gone back and read the reports that came to council when council agreed to skirt and when council agreed to the cost share. It does not talk about a cap and it does not talk about the CDM standards that was only added after. So at a governance level, visibility for councillors about what was being agreed, it seems like there were significant gaps in information. And I can't understand why that was. Well, I think you'll recall um, under the funding of renewals, we actually had to get that information, that cabinet paper, through an official information request because the government wouldn't share it with us. So there were decisions being made by one party that we weren't um, even aware they were making those decisions. And when they made the decisions, we'd heard the decision would be made, but they wouldn't share it with us. So um, it would be fair to say that um, um, some of the funding decisions um, this organisation wasn't aware of that they were being made or even considered um, until it, they were a fait accompli. But if you if you go back and read the council document that was established, you know, resilience and betterment. The vision for rebuilding earthquake damaged infrastructure is about creating resilient infrastructure that gives people security and confidence yeah, in the future, future of Christchurch. Christchurch. That that high level vision yeah. and ambition is quite a different thing about what actually got done. Oh, I'm sorry, I take issue with that. 
Um, we were, as well, constrained to not change what was there unless there was clear funding available or clear willingness. And that's a very difficult process to drive. We built resilience by putting in better materials and better design processes and better um, construction processes, most of which is invisible. And that's buried in the half of the value of the half of the spend, which is in the sewers. So yes, people aren't conscious of that and aren't aware of it. I would love to have built better intersections as you cite, and um, it seemed to me a failing of our collective processes that we weren't able to address that. But pressure wastewater and vacuum wastewater to me were just horrendous stories because we recognised within the first weeks of skirt there'd be areas where it was not sensible to rebuild with gravity sewer. So. As engineers, we came up with concepts. The community hugely accepted those concepts, but a tiny minority, in one case it was less than 7% of the community, objected. And yet the council decided it would go with those objectors, and we had to change away from pressure or vacuum sewer back to gravity sewer. And that was directed at skirt. It wasn't, and it was a council decision. It wasn't. A skirt decision. And, was not to engage with the Jeez. and to proceed without that community engagement Correct. that ended up costing us Correct. how many millions in court and lost time and having to go back and revisit it. So that's why I thought that's quite a powerful lesson. I agree. You know, if we'd spent the time engaging with local communities about what was being proposed, we may have actually, you know, had a more efficient response. Although engagement is a very yeah. tricky process. Yep, understood. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just think there's been gaps in advice that we've had at the council table, and it speak. is identified in here around. Um, and sorry, I don't, I don't have the page number because I screenshotted it. But you know, there's a point in the skirt value of skirt. Sarah, NZTA, and CCC do not have a common understanding about levels of service to be delivered and where. And I think the other thing is that councillors at a governance level did not get sufficient advice over what was being agreed to. So things like the infrastructure cap. The, the two main reasons council signed the cost share around this council table, no cap on the infrastructure, and government was going to do the convention centre. And we were told that, in, in fact, in our report, we were told that the Crown wanted a cap on the infrastructure, that we had not been able to agree to a figure, and therefore we were not agreeing to that as part of agreeing to the cost share, which is effectively all the way through this, we are being told there was a cap put in place. Actually, that's not what we agreed to. Okay. Yeah. There's two things, but and that's, I think that's, basically that's, if you have a look, there's a lesson learned up there, yeah. establish the appropriate reporting lines under the various agencies, which would include this, as quickly as possible. So that, that was clear right from the outset of what was done. At the end of the day, you may have had an understanding about the cost share, but the cost share also clearly spelt what the Crown's obligation was, and they could turn around and say, well, there it says there that we will meet the civil defence guidelines, and that's what the civil defence guidelines, and... Then Sorry, the government decided you're, you're our full obligation hey, well, yeah, is I mean, there. I knew you do this. We're not going to sit here and discuss the cost yet. We're here to talk about the skirt program, the value and the legacy. Yes. It's been identified in all the reports that the funding and the governance around the owner partners was problematic. We know that. We've discussed it for the last five, six years. Yes. Okay? So can you move on right. to so another question? In terms of the chair's report, it says that it's unanimous um, decision making around the HIG board, but my understanding is we as a partner, even though we're a minority partner, we're raising objections to the change in standards. We had argued around the change of standards all the way through. However, there is a governance structure that in actual fact puts all those arguments at the table and, and basically there was a agreement that because of these constraints, this was the best way forward. We were arguing as much as I've said that we could get into those agreements if we possibly could. Right. So do you think the governance structure was is something in terms of reviewing, in terms of having some sort of independence instead of having the three kind of, you know, NZTA, SERA, Council, where we ended up sort of being the minority in terms of central government? Well, if you have a look at it, it had an independent theory, it had an independent chair. 
and uh, Mark Ford was the independent chair initially, and then he got sick. Chris uh, McKenzie took over the role temporarily, um, and then he stayed until the whole end. Um, so the idea was that uh, Horizontal Infrastructure had an independent chair. So it had a representative of us, had a representative of Sarah, a representative of NZTA, and an independent chair. That is what that... Um, okay. Um, so just the final question I had was um, the, the environmental benefits, that there is report through this that there's, there's reference to things like the pipelining. I think that's got a, a $64 million liability attached to trying the new technology with the pipes that didn't work, as I read it. Um, there's some stuff now, I think, that we're aware of around some of the pressure sewer systems, which is an ongoing liability. In terms of the overall sort of environmental sustainability uh, impacts on our waterways, all, all things that were identified in the um, in, in the you know skirt plan at the announcement uh, and with the information, have we got a kind of environmental report around the environmental impacts or the sustainability impacts that that were identified? So we can kind of clearly see you know here's, here were the specific environmental measures that we achieved. All, all I could say is we've spent whatever the figure is um, on wastewater, which would all be keeping, um, there is a table in here somewhere, isn't there? If you look at the majority of the spend, it, it went on to wastewater. Not sure why it doesn't upgrade up there. Um, oh, it's trying to catch you. There it is. Go back one. Go back one. This one. This way. Yeah. Um, yeah. All of that work that we've done on wastewater will be protecting the environment. Some of the procedures that um, Skirt employed, um, we admittedly helped uh, develop them. They've been transferred into every new project that we do to try and um, protect the environment. There are some issues, as we know, around laterals uh, and that overflowing and some of our causing some uh, real strain on some of the vacuum, but that's because of high groundwater and because of leaking laterals, not because of the um, sewer. So, you know, from an environmental point of view, uh, the amount of work you can see in wastewater, which um, it was a figure somewhere that gave a percentage on, um, uh, it's a percentage that we've done, um, has been, been a massive um, compared to the number of overflows. We sit and we, I believe, John, sit within our Wastewater overflows consenting now. Um, certainly we wouldn't have if we didn't have any of this kind of work done. On an individual project basis, options were costed and uh, environmental impacts were considered and long-term sustainability was considered uh, when options were on the table, project by project. And generally speaking, a short report was done on every project um, that was put up, there was something like 500 reports created uh, which were evaluated by the asset owner group. So I'm pretty comfortable that we took good decisions. Of course, some of them include liabilities. Right. Okay, Pauline? Um, just, I've got a question on the design of 43B. Wow. And where we use that, if there is a network failure within five years, the Crown agreed to pay 50% of revisiting that. Has there been any, any cases of that so far that we had to apply for it? And we, we no, can't answer that. We haven't, um, sorry, I don't have that information of where a repair done um, has failed within that five years, so we Depending can't. Five years start and finish. From when the on project was done. Yeah, yeah that's right. What's the earliest it could be? It oh, some start. of them were done within 2012. Right. Mm. So it'd be over. So be and would any of those apply to our drinking water network? And could any of the issues that we're seeing now be a result of? I couldn't answer the second part, but yes, John says that some of the 43B standards were applied to the water network. Uh, whether any of those have failed, we don't have that information, but you know, it, it hasn't raised its head to us. Uh, it just, I sort of think Sorry. about the 
So, sorry, as far, as far as my recollection of the 43 and the five years was, it was the eligibility. When we did the asset assessment, we, there was an assessment made, would that asset fail within five years? And oh. if we thought that it would fail, it was eligible. Yeah. So... And if he thought it wouldn't, it wouldn't. Mm. That's right. So the issue really is, have we got assets that have failed within five years that weren't repaired by Skirt? Yes, we have. But, yeah. Skirt's um, finished, so we can't go back to Skirt and ask right, them to I do that. Right, I understand. Okay, yeah. right. So is there, a, um, is there a possibility that because we've gone in and fixed some of our drinking water network, it's caused blowouts down there? So cause and effect that we could be seeing burst mains, etc., because of we've strengthened one part of it, so the... No, no? That, that's highly unlikely. Right. What we're probably seeing in the water network is, as David mentioned earlier, some of our materials, particularly asbestos cement, have been subject to micro-cracking, and micro-cracking allows water ingress, which increases softening of the pipe and earlier failure. Earlier failure because we haven't been doing our renewals, or uh, no? Because earlier of failure be than what? essentially legacy of the earthquake, the earthquake will have yeah. created micro cracking, mm -hmm. um, yeah, shortening the it. shortening the asset yeah. life, which meant that it hadn't failed at the time, yeah. but it fails at a much sooner time than we would normally right. expect. Yep. I think we did a assessment early on, done by Opus, and it showed, on average, we lost about five or six years off the life of our assets. I think it was five or six years, wasn't it? Yeah, was it Opus well, who did that? No, no, did it. Skirt. Yeah. Skirt did it. Skirt did it? Mm. Yeah, someone did it. Mm. Dave Hyler. Thank you. Mm. OK, thanks very much. Any other questions? OK, look, um, thanks, gents. It's obviously, there's a lot in here. Um, a lot of stuff we've discussed previously um, and still stuff that we will continue to discuss into the future, especially around the way we contract. So the alliance model um, and the good stuff that's come out. And obviously there are some issues that still will be ongoing in terms of how governance works around big projects and how you know the Crown works with local government, ultimately. Um, and especially in a disaster situation. That's you know not going to go away. Um, OK, so we've got a resolution here to receive the report. I mean, we have got here request a series of workshops. I mean, I think that's a wee bit vague. Um, I think what I quite like is that we actually will sit down and discuss, not today, but what, what things we'd like to hear back from, and it could be the, the contracting models um, and other aspects, so we'll leave it open for the moment. Um, I'm happy to, to move that, I have a seconder, a seconder David, um, any debate? Yeah, Yanni and then... You, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that the people that did the work at Skirt as the delivery vehicle did an amazing job in very difficult conditions. But I, I, you know, I think there has to be a key lesson about the governance arrangements. And you know, it's it's been said that actually, you know, if this happens again, um, people won't be eligible for the indemnity for very long, and other councils, uh, or possibly us, will face a similar situation. The whole way in which ASCO uh, repairs were budgeted in terms of the, the horizontal infrastructure group, the governance around it, the funding around it, um, I, I think just has so, so much room for improvement. And I think it's really best picked up in the report into the central city, which you know makes the comment that far too often things were looked at as a best for project approach rather than a best of city approach. And, and I think, you know, I would add best for community in there as well, because it really seemed to me that it's a huge lost legacy to have a much more environmentally sustainable, modern, resilient city by the way in which governance decisions were made in regards to the skirt program. But that's not to criticise the people that have done the work. It's really, I think, a question for us at a governance level. You know, you, you go back and read the documents and um, just about every good document's attached to this report except one, which is the original report that came to council to get council to agree to the cost share agreement. And I know in the cost share agreement, 
that it says that the CEDAM, you know, standards are the ones that will be applied to. That was never said to the councillors when we sat around this table and voted on to agree to the cost share. That was never advised to us. We were never advised that there would be a cap. In fact, quite the opposite. In our own report, it makes it very clear that there would be no cap. But the other report that is in this, which is, I think, worthwhile just to highlight to you, is that when Council agreed to skirt and the Alliance delivery model, we were told, as part of that advice, the Council, as ultimate owner of the assets, would retain control of scope and standards of the work to be performed. And it never happened. It never happened. And that's why we've seen so many really, I think, unfortunate outcomes around not being able to get things done that would make sense in a modern day, in a modern uh, city. So, you know, there's a lot of places, Fitzgerald Ave, um, which some of us tried, and, and there'll be others, you know, roundabouts and intersections. Asphalt, places that used to have asphalt that have now been chip sealed, where communities struggle to understand how those decisions were made. But fundamentally, it's good to get this information. It's good to get this report. I welcome doing some more exploration in terms of workshops around specific things. And I do think we need to think about how governance decisions are made across council and central government, because I think that's really key to why this didn't work as well as it could have. Thank you, Yanni. Well done. Um, uh, Leanne. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with Yanni. Um, I've been very keen to have this report um, for a long time. And so I, I just want to acknowledge all of the pre presenters, Dave, Peter, um, Rod, and also um, Pierre, because uh, you've, you've th thrown yourself into the mix around another interesting issue, which is around the, the model that was able, well, not able to be brought over but not able to be utilised and I think that helps people understand why certain things have happened in a particular way. Um, it has helped put together a puzzle which I think has confused a lot of people uh, and when I say a lot of people I mean the public so the, the lessons learnt which um, I think would have been uh, quite good for us to um, sort of endorse those today is that while the cost share agreement was clear, there was a large gap in understanding between the partners and the public around exactly what was going to be delivered around horizontal infrastructure repair and replacement. Um, that couldn't be truer, and it was the same for the councillors as well at the time. So Yanni's correct when he refers to the, um, the paper that went to the council. It didn't um, mention the... Um, the detail of the cost sharing agreement in relation to um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the um, civil defence and emergency management framework uh, for the application of the funding. Um, and it didn't have the cap re referenced in it. What it said was that the government wanted to cap it out at $1.8 million. The, the uh, cost sharing agreement had that written into it and it was signed by the government two days, the two government ministers, two days before it went to the council. And so that, that's actually what happened. And what was added were two um, uh, uh, appendices to the report were added, signed off by the chief executive of, um, well, the, the, the head of CCDU, and uh, the chief executive of the council because they had the authority to make changes that were for the point of clarification. And so it went in that there would be an independent review. Of course, that wasn't done um, at the time. So, and I want to also say that right at the very start, and that's why the statement about the public perception, we were promised a 21st century resilient city no one said as long as it falls within the government's um, framework for decision making and that we have the opportunity to change the rules part way through. But I want to acknowledge Skirt. I think it was tremendous. I think it could have added value by having, by doing all of the work right across the board and you pick that up in all of your um, comments that you've made today. It could have worked with Enable, with Orion, with the council and we could have actually made considerable progress and yes, let the money falls where it, fall where it lies, um, pick up the tab at the end of the day, allocate the money fairly um, and in accordance with the agreement. Um, but that has to be determined right from the outset and that's the biggest lesson learned. So thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Glenn. 
Thank you. I've got uh, two main points, but a little wee story. I remember a, a thank you barbecue from Skirt on the corner of Pages and Breezes Road with a couple of those um, put up things, whatever you call them, and um, uh, the locals... Easy ups. Easy ups. Easy ups, that's right. And the locals thought it was great. Um, it was to celebrate the conclusion of, I think, Pages Road, uh, but the locals <laughs> were as direct as usual, you know, well, thank you for the sausage, but what took you so long? So, and to me, that, that kind of exemplifies the uh, just direct relationship that I think many people in the local community had with Skirt, who were the builders. And it was a very robust relationship, and I'd like to acknowledge Ross, who was part of many of the street mm. meetings there, along with, uh, you know, Haiti and Marie Moira, others uh, like that. It, we ended up inventing, really, I think, other ways of community engagement because you'll see on page 407, and I back Yanni on this, that uh, Skirt concluded that they would be uh, associated with the first two columns of the IAP2 spectrum, which is what they presented to the Burwood Pegasus Community Board. So you can move further along that if you wish, but that is what they understood was their approach, their kind of modus operandi. So when we did have problems, we had to uh, host community meetings and get on the front foot, and that actually worked. I th and I, th I think um, when there is a next time, because there will be that, uh, to borrow Raf's phrase from before, it's that stitch in time. You know, get in early, take the community with you. Me and Yanni lost the debate over the... Uh, poo tanks thing when we had a horses for courses approach over the different um, uh, wastewater systems otherwise that might have worked so what was okay for South Shore over poo tanks wasn't okay for Parklands every community is different the only other comment I'll make is that when the Alpine fault goes I'm not sure how much money there will be around for anybody actually but we will need in, in the same way that we'll need clarity with the insurance companies and, and the UQC will need that sort of clarity worked out in, ad, in advance between uh, Crown and councils because people will be uh, in shock. <laughs> no one will be thinking straight and we really do need a plan uh, to address that but th that's going to be huge. But thank you. Um, we, we did get streets fixed. It was a very robust uh, relationship but um, We've still got a long way to go, though, when you look at those. Uh, despite the, the money that's been put up there, if you reconcile that with our roading maps, um, which we have, there's still a fair way to go. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Um, David? Uh, uh, Jimmy? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But you went back to the you know, 2011, after earthquake, a you know, lot of the uncertainty. So these the. Uh, 317 pages is reasonable. We can learn a lot from the, uh, this one. Particularly convince me the attachment, attachment one, the Toronto Infrastructure Governance Group. Actually, that's true, you know, that's true. The 4.9, I would like to repeat again. The key program achievement ensure the Toronto Infrastructure Program was delivered on time to budget and specification based for recovery outcome. So we need to learn, you know, because uncertainty, the situation, the short time period before the 2013 can organize this governance and also management, the, the model and the buyer and the supply, you know, all given together, even government, the central government, they have a skirt, they have the NZTA, you know, focus on those the three, the, kind of waters or the routing, which one is priority, etc. And also uh, council, how to work in together with those the, uh, central government or with those the, uh, kind of five the different the, 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 the supply. It actually is not easy. It's a bigger the, the challenge, bigger engineering. So we uh, learn a lot. Actually, we do appreciate those the, all, all, all those the, the uh, government agency and those the, 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 the Probably the 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 the, the, uh, the supplier, you know, to make the uh, this the uh, happen. But I do think the the how to point the two is very very important. We need to pop the need to you know to to listen to more separate uh, 
lost the workshop, you know, give us the more kind of opportunity to learn, and we can improve uh, all the uh, kind of the uh, property management and uh, all the, the kind of function of governance and the uh, management model. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Dion? Uh, thanks. Um, and, and yeah, thank you very much for coming in and presenting. It's really good to read. Actually, I really enjoyed reading that report, and it's good that it's, you know, all of that stuff's public. It's, um, it's been quite an eye-opener, actually. Um, and, and I'll echo the, um, I, was, I was reflecting a little bit before when I was reading the report over the last few days, and actually when, after the earthquake, driving home and seeing the damage and the amount of liquefaction and all the water and the roads were warped and things were popped up out of the road to where we are now, I think you know, it's, it's, it's a long way. And, and actually the work that Skirt did straight after that and everybody that's been involved has been exceptional. And um, you know, there's a lot of unsung heroes in, in the, uh, the rebuild of the city and the infrastructure that should be congratulated because they just got stuck in and did it. And I think that's, you know, that's one of the legacies of um, you know, the togetherness of the program. And you know, I would echo the, the, the conversation to when things happen again, we need to bring in the services as well, um, not just infrastructure, but the service providers such as, you know, power, internet cables and everything like that, because it's important to get everything done once and, and done properly because, you know, as I said before, the, the dig the road up and then seal it and then dig the road up and seal it, that was and still is the biggest gripe that people have, it's, it, it, and it shouldn't happen. But anyway, back to the report, I still have... I still have you know, a, a few gripes on, on the land drainage recovery program issue um, and yeah, we are doing that, um, you know, that, that wrap up thing at the moment but I just I feel that you know, the city has been a bit shafted in that uh, program and we are actually missing out on something that in my opinion I think we're eligible to get um, as part of that um, earthquake damage. It's, it's a big amount of money. And that's just $127.5 million in that year three to 10 of that program. That's an eligible program. The program itself is over a billion dollars. So there's only, a, it's, you know, it's 10%. The other thing that I sort of, I really, I think that we got shafted a little bit on is, is the end wash up costs here. I, I'm really digging into the costs and we are sitting at $14 million more than that 2015 share cost and yet the government still had $88 million left on their budgeted cost. And I understand that, um, that there was eligibility and all that kind of thing, but there must have been money in their budget still um, that I can see here that, that could have actually gone towards that water repairs that we're starting to have to face. And we've only had 3% of our water infrastructure repaired, and we've got a long way to go. So um, thanks, government. and. Thanks everybody who did the work, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, well, I'll finish it up. Um, I mean, when people ask me to sum up the rebuild in a few words, um, I say overpromised and underbudgeted. And that's never a place you want to be as someone who's trying to pr provide facilities. And having overpromised and underbudgeted, the government was constantly trying to dial back on how much money it spent and I think you know they they made a, a serious error in doing that because the long-term costs of those short-term savings will be exponentially higher um, and for the sake of you know whatever they had to do getting to surplus in a particular year um, yeah they really squeezed what was a program running at full pace uh, for no reason um, and that was a setback. And I think that's a real lesson for future governments um, uh, when they're looking at uh, spending money on infrastructure. Uh, the, you know, the lessons learned are pretty clear. They're pretty consistent through all the different reports. The governance is crucial. Um, the way the model operated, I think, was pretty good. I had a lot to do with the skirt team. I found them very professional. Um, got to know engineers, they're not, not bad sorts really, once you get to know them. But you know, there was, there was a sense of mission there, um, that the engagement with the public was really good and the feedback was great there. Certainly lots of lessons around when you can take the community with you to do that. Obviously in a disaster response situation you don't always have time, 
but sometimes you do, and I think that's important. Uh, the, the example Yani gave about that intersection, one of the lessons for us is to have information in our systems which show what betterment might look like. So everywhere you run your curse around the city, it might say, oh, we'd like a roundabout here, or we'd like a set of traffic lights here. So if something does happen, that you do go to repair that particular piece, it pops up and you actually have that information there. So I think that's quite um, a useful piece of work in terms of you know, how we incorporate that into our asset management system. We may not be spending the money now, but if something happened, that's something that we would like to do um, in the future. Um, so yeah, just really, you know, official congratulations to the team. They did a great job. Um, it was a stand-up uh, organization. Uh, they were professional uh, and focused um, and, you know, really did the job within the constraints that they had um, to deliver for the people of Christchurch. Um, but we have a lot to learn. There is going to be a discussion around the civil uh, defence uh, emergency response. That's probably a discussion we want to be involved in, in terms of giving the feedback. Uh, at the moment, it's very much a Treasury discussion, but I think they need to come down and talk to us about it, talk to the governors. Uh, talk to the community um, and obviously talk to the staff. Um, so hopefully uh, that will happen in due course. So thanks Rod for coming in um, and thanks to um, your team uh, for putting the report together. So I'll put uh, the motion. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against. That's carried. Thank you.